Today we're taking a departure from our usual cocktail episode style, I guess. Uh, usually when I do cocktail episodes, I like to have some type of theme, I guess. Like, I don't know, nightcap cocktails, which actually is a really good idea. I should probably do a nightcap cocktails video. We did one in the past, but we should probably do some more because nightcap cocktails don't get enough love. Today's episode is actually a good idea that Marius had. And like when we were searching through our stuff, we came upon this little black book. This is a, a, a moleskin that has seen a lot of better days. This was my little black book that I used when I was bartending before we had the use of Evernote or any other type of like notes app inside phones. I would use a little black book filled with all my cocktail recipes so that I could just quickly reference the ones that were called without having to search the internet. Even in the modern day, I kind of like the idea of a little black book a little better than a bartender pulling out their phone and then like looking for something because it, I don't know if it's just me or if it's just some kind of prejudice that I have or something. But anytime a bartender pulls out a phone and starts looking at it behind the bar, I automatically think they're slacking off. But when a bartender pulls out a little black book, I know that there's useful information inside said little black book and that they are doing their job. So I thought, not I thought, actually, it wasn't my thought at all. Marius thought it'd be kind of fun to go through this little black book and pull out some cocktail recipes and do them for you today. So the theme of today's video is Leandro's Little Black Book. I went through here and kind of randomly picked some cocktails that we're going to do today. There's lots of workshopping of ingredients. Like when I opened this up the other day, I found like a little scrap of paper with a little like... I'm, I believe just something that I was workshopping at the time. It looks like a champagne cocktail variation with sweet vermouth and fernet. And I don't know if we ever made this or anything. I can't, it's never made it into my rotation, so. But also just like in the back of the book here, there's just like uh, different shots that we would do at the bar. Here's like me workshopping another cocktail. This was the Sage Hen when I was doing the competition. This is a Plymouth Gin competition. We have definitely done this cocktail on this channel before. So anyway, it's falling apart. I love this little black book. I've kept it near and dear to my heart. I think everyone should have a little black book. Let's get into making the cocktails from the little black book. Leandro's got a book. A little black book full of cocktail dreams, shaking not shook, mixing up the magic in every single page. Sipping on a secret from a bygone age. So the first cocktail that we're doing today is one that I got from a cocktail book a long time ago. I put it into my rotation at Kohl's because I thought it would do very well, and it became a customer favorite. The Just for Mary was created by Tony Abu Ghanim, and he featured it in his book, The Modern Mixologist. Today, I'm going to make it for you. So in a stirring glass, we're going to do two dashes of orange bitters, half an ounce of Lillet, white wine aperitivo, half an ounce of cherry liqueur. We're using a uh, cherry hearing. And if you want to sub this out, you got to make sure that you're using an actual cherry liqueur and not like an eau de vie or a cherry brandy because those are not the same thing. And then we're going to do two ounces of rye whiskey. We're using Rittenhouse here. And I will say this, Rittenhouse has a higher concentration of corn in its mash bill. So if you're using something like Rittenhouse, you're actually playing up the sweetness just a little bit. It kind of like, it's like a hundred proof rye that hits like a bourbon. It's a little bit sweeter because it has a lot more corn in it than some other rye. That said, it also balances that sweetness out with the proof. So you get a little bit of heat from that 100 proof and it kind of balances it all out. It's one of my favorites to use for this particular cocktail. Uh, I did not get ice. So let's do that. Crack the first cube. There you go. And give this a nice stir. I like to use a Nick and Nora for this guy and strain it. I will say this, if your cherry hearing is fresher, this cocktail is gonna be less brown and a lot more red. But my cherry hearing has been sitting around for a while and it is shelf stable and everything, but the cherry will change color over time. Boop, little Luxardo cherry in the bottom of the glass. Let's give it a sip, cheers. What I find so brilliantly wonderful about this drink is that it's very rye forward and you get those nice kind of bready, yeasty, spicy rye notes, but then you add a little complexity from the Lillet and the botanicals used in the Lillet. And then it has a back palate cherry that's also very full in flavor. It's not overly sweet. What's really nice about it is that you've got that cherry flavor, you get a little bit of the botanicals in the middle, and then it's balanced out by the spice of the rye. It's really nice. So there it is, guys, just for Mary. 
The next cocktail I decided to do is one that I haven't done in this channel in a while. It, we do have an old episode on it. I don't think that many people actually watch it. It's a fantastic cocktail. It was taught to me by a bartender named Danny Symbol, who used to work with me at Kohl's. And at the same time that he was working at Kohl's, he was working at another bar in Pasadena called 1886, which is a fantastic cocktail bar. Apparently they had this bartending manual that wasn't very interesting, but in it they saw a recipe for a cocktail called a Shanghai Gin Fizz. And then I guess they just took that recipe and just decided to put it into an equal parts last word format. And it is fantastic. It is actually one of my absolute favorite cocktails. I finally found this Faccia Bruto Center Bay Giallo, which is the yellow chartreuse alternative that they made. Now, one thing about this stuff is, well, I haven't tasted it, so we're gonna taste it blind here, but this stuff is on limited edition and it only comes out once a year. So for an alternative for yellow chartreuse, I'm not sure it's gonna work for a lot of people because it's very hard to find and it's about 75 bucks. So it's just as expensive as yellow chartreuse, but I'm excited to try it just to see how close it is to yellow chartreuse. And we're gonna taste taste it side by side with the real thing. I would have blind tasted it, but you can tell which is which very easily because one is very dark gold and the other one is very light yellow. Huh? So. Unless you blind taste it, literally. Oh, like literally blind taste it? You wanna, do you want what? Because to see what I like better? Do you want to? Sure. Okay, well then get out the box. I don't wanna pour too much out. I don't know how much yellow chartreuse we have. I think we're gonna have to make a trip down to Mexico to get some more. Just do a bandana. Oh, you just wanna go straight up like yeah, we can do bandana. Hold on. I, let me go get the, let me go get my favorite bandana. I thought that this um, Ouija board, not too sweet bandana from Mover and Shaker would be kind of a fun one to use, right? I can confirm that I can't see a damn thing. And then you have to, you have to mix them up. Testing Leandro's palette to see. I have no idea. I don't, can't see anything. No, no, I haven't switched them out. Oh, so the one on my left is chartreuse that's the yellow the, the more light yellow one and the one on my right is the giallo which is the darker yellow one yellow chartreuse is distinctive enough going like this okay so i'm moving it here hold on first let's smell whoa 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 that was the edge of the thing wow Ooh, that, oh my God, they are very similar, dude. That's crazy. That's yellow chartreuse though, I can tell. It seems like this is the chartreuse. But this is so, they like really did a good job backwards deconstructing the, the nose on this, dude. It's pretty crazy. Whoa. Well, this is chartreuse for sure. This is the giallo. This is like almost lighter in flavor. Like it has that, you know, kind of very unique chartreuse botanical flavor. But then this like ha like explodes in flavor on your palate, whereas this one kind of gets more subdued. Very similar, but this one is the more flavorful one for sure. But it's different. It's, it's, it's a little bit different, but it's very close. Like this will work in any chartreuse cocktails. Let's see if I was right. Eh? Yep, that's the chartreuse. Mm, my, my vision is all blurry. The problem with this is that it can't really be much of a substitute if it's super hard to find, just as expensive, and uh, like a yearly product. I mean, like you have just as much chance of finding this as you do of this. But I do really enjoy this product. I'm glad that I have a bottle. The company did not send this to me. I actually found this bottle um, at a store in downtown. Carries all the Faccia Bruto stuff. And of all the stuff that I have tasted, which I have not tasted at all, the Faccia Bruto stuff is really good. Okay, I'm gonna stop it with the commercial, the Faccia Bruto commercial. I actually think that this guy might be a little bit better in the Shanghai Gin than this guy. Equal parts, super easy. Let's start with our lemon. Three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. Three quarters of an ounce of yellow chartreuse or this Center Bay Giallo. Three quarters of an ounce gin. I like to use the uh, Plymouth Gin because it's a little bit less juniper heavy. It's like basically the same as London Dry Gin, but it's just got a little bit less juniper. London Dry Gin is gonna make it really uh, juniper punchy, which does work very well in this cocktail, but it's nice to have the more subdued Plymouth. Three quarters of an ounce of Benedictine, which consequently is often touted as a yellow chartreuse alternative, although it tastes very different than yellow chartreuse. In a pinch, you can put this in yellow chartreuse cocktails and it will work. Kind of defeats the point for this particular drink, but you know, for other ones. Nick and Nora, get a shake. Let's 
grain. And for our garnish, I like to have a nice small slice of lemon. So what we're gonna do here is break out the mandolin, which I've been using lately. Oh, what have you been using it for? Well, funny that you ask, Marius. I've been using the mandolin for our hand cut garnishes that you can find in our store at theeducatedbarfly.com. So if you want to have some nice, sustainable, beautiful, aromatic, dehydrated citrus garnishes, go check it out on theeducatedbarfly.com. Nice and thin. And then just float that on top like so. Cheers. So good. You would think that with uh, Benedictine, which is pretty high in sugar, and then also the Giallo, which obviously has some sugar, or Yellow Chartreuse, which also has some sugar that it would be overly sweet, but it actually does such a good job of balancing out that lemon. It's nice and tart and bright. And then you get the botanicals of the gin. It is a fantastic gin cocktail. It's one of those gin cocktails that will convince people who don't like gin to like gin. So there it is, guys, the Shanghai Gin. The Cornwall Negroni was created by New York City bartender Phil Ward in 2006 after attending a workshop uh, given by Gary Regan, uh, maybe on the Negroni. Gary Regan was very famous for not only the Negroni, but like stirring it with his finger. So that would make sense. The workshop was in Cornwall on Hudson, New York. Uh, that would make sense. Uh, the Cornwall Negroni, and Cornwall on Hudson. You know, anyway, that's some deep thoughts here. So because this is a Negroni variation, I like to build mine in a glass. If you want to build yours in a mixing glass, then go right on ahead if you feel like that is more, I don't know, visually appealing. But I like to just put mine in a glass, especially when you're bartending, it's just less to do. You just have one less step, less dishes to clean, you know. One dash of bitters. I do Fegan's bitters, which is a mix of Regan's and Fee's. I'm sure that Phil Ward used Regan's bitters because Gary Regan had his own bitters company. Or he, made, he made his own orange bitters. That became super famous. I like to use my mix. Oh, I didn't get out all the stuff. I did, but I didn't like bring it here. Oh, so there's this. I need gin. Can you give me a London Dry actually for this particular cocktail? I don't know, a tank array or, or yeah, beef eater. Beef eater's cool. That's cool. Low cost, high quality. Can't beat that. Thought that I was uh, prepared, but I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not prepared at all. This is gonna just be super easy. One and a half, 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 three ounce cocktail. So we're gonna go half an ounce of sweet vermouth here. I'm using the Coqui de Torino. And then we're gonna do half an ounce of Punta Mess, which is an Amaro vermouth blend. And it must be kept in the fridge to be kept fresh, but it does last quite a long time. It actually lasts a little longer than traditional vermouth does. Half an ounce Campari and one and a half ounces of gin. I like to use a London and Dry in this particular one because I want that punchy juniper and all those botanicals to blend with the botanicals in this guy and the botanicals in this guy. I will say this stuff is delicious. You can drink it neat. It's yummy. It will give you a horrendous hangover if you drink too much. And I think it's the botanicals that do it. Vermouth also is kind of a terrible hangover if you don't drink enough water. And we're gonna get one nicely tempered ice here and drop it in, give it a stir. We're going to need an orange twist. Let's give it a sip. Hmm, that is fantastically full flavored. Definitely the botanicals of the gin, the Campari is there, but doesn't dominate. You do get that nice back palate bitterness as the flavor develops on your tongue. And then you get a lot of that vermouth and Amaro, like right in the middle of the cocktail. But what's nice is that it's pairing a vermouth with a vermouth Amaro. So it's really punching the vermouth up and you get a lot of that complexity. Vermouth is a little bit, um, it's got a little bit of a uh, viscosity to it, uh, which is really nice. And it creates a really nice texture in the drink. It's just just a great Negroni variation, one you guys should absolutely try. So there it is, guys, the Cornwall Negroni. So the Seven Sins was a cocktail that a bartender named John Coltharp made. And basically all it is is a Jack Rose made a little bit more whiskey forward by just splitting the base with rye. So you get a little bit fuller of a cocktail and it's really fantastic. It was one of the favorites that I would serve at Coles. So we're gonna do it today. And I don't think I've actually ever done it on this channel. But a lot of people are just gonna be like, oh, well, it's just a Jack Rose with one ingredient change, which is true. But that one ingredient makes a lot of difference in the cocktail, you know? Some would say it makes all the difference. I mean, yeah, I mean, it does. It makes all the difference. I think that uh, if you look at anything that Milk and Honey made over the years, Milk and Honey's entire MO was making a one or two ingredient change on very well-known templates that they, well, templates that they found back in the day, kind of modernized, and then they became well-known. All right, so we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice here. 
three quarters of an ounce of grenadine. And if you want to know how to make it, this is like the lazy grenadine. Go to uh, that syrups episode we did so long ago. And then we'll do one ounce of uh, rye whiskey. We're using the 100 proofer because we want to match the proof with, wait for it, 100 proof Applejack here. And Applejack is just American apple brandy, also known as Applejack. That is a reference to the jacking process that they used to do back in the day where they take some apple cider that was in a cask and they would bury it in the wintertime and it would slowly freeze under the ground. And as it froze, it also fermented. And when they pulled it out, they would drill into the middle of it and take out the pure alcohol, which is very dangerous. And there's lots of weird chemical elements that happen in that process that can definitely hurt you. So don't do it. But that's what they used to do back in the day before they had any knowledge of these terrible things that can happen to you. If you do not have Applejack in your area, you can use Calvados apple brandy. Just make sure that you use uh, VSLP and over. This is a prototype of a new Barfly glass. We are making some tweaks to the design and uh, hopefully it'll be out soon, but we are currently working on it. And we're gonna give it a strain. Oh, and the other actual change from a Jack Rose is that Jack Roses are made with lime juice and this switched out for lemon, which isn't a huge change, but lemons are a tiny bit sweeter and less tart than a lime would be. So we're just gonna give it a little grated cinnamon garnish here. Let's give it a taste. Jack Roses, I think, could be a little bit thin, but the addition of that 100 proof whiskey, that rye whiskey, gives it some spice, it gives it some body, it gives it more barrel notes, which all play in to a very nice cocktail, but you still get those big juicy pomegranate notes from the grenadine and also the tartness of the lemon. It is chef's kiss. There it is, the Seven Sins.